Our next speaker is uh, Francesca Tancini, who is uh, at Bologna University Library, both as a librarian and art historian. She works in the uh, very interesting art library of the Federico Zeri Foundation. Uh, she has also done research in a very wide range, geographically very wide range of places, and I hope that we will hear a bit more about uh, her experiences in different libraries. She's talking to us this afternoon about illustrated uh, Victorian popular books and using a great deal of archival evidence as well as the books themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Lara, for uh, the invitation to this conference. And also, thank you for the introspective work you requested us to do. <laughs> because to talk about methodologies and approaches, particularly when regarding an in-progress research, forced, forced us, well, me, uh, to self-examination. So to shift my focus from the book itself, done from the work uh, uh, itself done so far, and, and, and to translate it with, to, to book with, with a different perspective. So, so I, I'll start with a uh, few words about my work by, by way of introduction. So I, I am an art historian, I am a rare book librarian on a daily basis, and I mainly focus on 19th century um, illustration. So during the first years of research, I was used to question the printed image in re its relationship with the text it was connected with, with so uh, which moments of the action were illustrated and how, how differently different illustrators dealt with the same text in different times and backgrounds, how much illustration influenced painting and the arts, and so on. Uh, at the same time, dealing with physical features of the image in connection with the book didn't really play a role in my approach. So features uh, such as which position uh, had the illustration within the book? Was the illustration intended for a cover? Was it for an out-of-text illustration, an in-text vignette? Uh, which book exactly contained it? Which edition, which issue? Did the image appear more than once and in more than one title? Uh, was it reward? to be reused in different positions and features, and how. So this regarding uh, these features and material components implied to also disregard the illustration itself as a result then and now of a commercial transaction between publisher, illustrator, engraver, printer, binder. Books, including illustrated books, are indeed clearly commercial goods set in specific, culturally determined, historically defined economic context, designed for a certain audience or market with texts and pictures commissioned according to rational editorial objectives and agendas. Books obeyed, as they still do, to strict editorial rules that make a book consistent with its series and or publisher, um, its price determines its binding, physical and graphical appearance, average number of pages, and vice versa. So these are key elements that art history and illustration history should borrow from the history of book and the history of publishing. As obvious as these assumptions might seem, these aspects have rarely been taken into account in an integrated perspective and applied to research on 19th century illustration. But, come to think of it, I'm now used to assess illustration both as a, as a departure point and a destination, following the steps that lead from the commission and conception of an illustration to its publication and inclusion, and inclusion in a printed text, which roughly goes from the moment the illustration was commissioned to the moment the drawing or drawings were executed. They could be accepted, refused, cancelled, or changes could be required. They could be in color, black and white, on paper, on tracing paper, or directly drawn onto the wood block. The payment was then recorded and records exist, both for published and unpublished works. Then matrices were engraved on wood, metal, stones, or indirectly obtained, photo engraved, electrotyped, cast. Proofs were printed, and the book was then advertised on, the on its first appearance on the market. And a great difference exists between a book advertised as to be published, 
or a book advertised as ready on this day, obviously, or now ready. And it was subsequently advertised again on the occasion of its later reissues as second edition, new edition, one volume edition, library edition, and so on. And a great ability is needed to correctly spot which advertisement corresponds to which copy traced in the frequent absence of editorial notes uh, on the book itself. All these evidences in different ways document, trace, and date works otherwise unidentifiable, untraceable, non-datable. So we'll start with the idyllic event that a written evidence of an order for an illustration existed, was then preserved, survived until today, and that have been able to trace it in some archives around the globe. The commission for an illustration could come directly from the publisher or much more frequently from the engraver or the printer. It can be in the form of a letter, a written note, a sketch, or it can survive as a reference in illustrators' diaries or in printers and, in and engravers' ledgers and account books. The major intermediary and often actor of editorial choices in Victorian times was the printer, particularly for direct agreements with illustrators and engravers, for the features of the image to be drawn, the color and details of the binding, etc. All the same, the publishers reserved their right to reject drawings or require changes. For example, the commission for this book, The Conscript, was received by the illustrator Walter Crane for Har from Harvey Orwin Smith. A wood engraver himself, he was also the middleman for publisher Smith, Elder and Co., and for several others. The illustrator called at the engraver's offices and got the commission. It is quite an easy task to trace back this book. We have title, The Conscript, A Tale of, French of the French War, a publisher, Smith, Elder and Co., and a date, 1865. But thanks to the illustrator's note, notes, we know more about the commission. The sketches were delivered the day after and were shown to the publishers, but not approved at all. New ones to be made. New ones were produced, indeed, apparently from different pages, and delivered. One, Napoleon's subject, was chosen. And supposedly, the supposedly final drawing was made and delivered. Uh, but two days after, some alterations were requested. Sorry, it's here. Um, conscript figure larger, Napoleon's face, sorry, I lost myself. Napoleon's face altered. And then again, a new underlined head to Napoleon I. The last one was ima eventually made and delivered. <coughs> so none of the half a dozen drawings produced for this commission survives today, but the printed book was advertised in Publishers Circular, several copies exist today, and it is even retrievable via Google Books. Sometimes the commission provided details about the page layout and detailed how to use the space to insert title, author, series name, publisher's imprint, and how each caption should be formulated. In this case, Evans commissioned the drawing and provided the illustrator with a sketch of how to lay out the cover, with title and author inserted in a circular shape in the center of the cover. The design was produced following these exact specifications and published. The research results are not always as clear as this. On May 1867, Walter Crane's diary records the reception of an order for a cover for Guy Livingstone. Starting from these details, we have title, Guy Livingstone, and date, 1867. It is possible to look up in Coeval Trade magazines for this title. And here, really, Google helps to check if it was actually published and who published it. And here it is, the advertisement in the bookseller, Guy Livingstone, 6th edition, Pox Octavo, 2 shilling, Routledge. Once that a publisher's name is obtained, it is possible to turn to library catalogues looking for title and publisher. Date is often of no use since these books are rarely dated. These books with three books with adequate title, format, and illustrated front cover appear all undated. They all have different covers. One is at UCLA, 
in the Michael Sadler collection. It's printed on yellow paper with a list of standard works of fiction on the back. One is at Trinity College Dublin with the same cover design as UCLA's, but printed on orange paper and with commercial advertisements on the back. The last one is at Emory University Library in the Chester Top Collection with a completely different cover design and a commercial advertisement for chlorodyne on the back. Unfortunately, no preparatory drawing survived to help us in spotting which is the work of our illustrator. And while connoisseurship and considerations about style uh, might point to the right answer, we need more artifacts if available. So providentially, Crane kept an, undate, uh, an undated sketch by Evans detailing layout and contents. Railway library, two shillings, Guy Livingstone, so now comparing the page layout, uh, it, is, it emerges clearly which of the two is Crane. So the second step is now to date the books and identify which of those bearing Crane's design was published first, the orange or the yellow. So to do for, so a further check is to be carried out on the end papers and paste downs and on the contents of back covers. Emory University copy lists on the end papers several titles, the last of which was issued in 1870. Trinity College copy had an advertisement on back cover containing a reference to Vienna World's Fair, 1873. UCLA copy lists on back cover several titles, so now well, I, I, I've not been, a, been able to trace the exact date for these titles, but while the title pages of the other two copies did not bear any notice of edition, so-called edition, this one read sixth edition, exactly as the 1867 advertisement did. So it is now possible to say that UCLA is the 1867 edition illustrated by Crane. So it's not always so easy to identify the printed book from the commissions because they not always contain useful editorial details to guide research. For example, we have a letter from Evans with the commission of a drawing for cover. Leave lettering as the title is undecided. So cross-checking the date of the commission with the list of works accomplished in the illustrator, illustrator's diary, this book with title yet undecided can be identified as called to account. Being now aware of the title, we are able to track down a drawing undated um, on tracing paper, and you see the double E uh, for the engraver's name. In the drawing, the title is, is struck through uh, as if that title yet undecided had been chosen, called to account, and then withdrawn in favor of another one. But in the British Library, a copy survives, apparently the only one in existence. It has the, exactly the same design on the front cover. British Library copy is undated, but bears a printer's mark dated December 1871. So documents can, do can sometimes be unre unreliable in univocally pinpointing the book, and this is true both for commission and drawings. For example, in this dra these drawings gives a date, April 1865, a title, Jane Rutherford, and a publisher's name, Wardlock and Tyler. A check on the illustrator's diary confirms the title um, and date and everything. So it is possible to trace an advertisement to where a book with the same features is listed. All the same, had not been able to trace any copy of this book anywhere. But one day at Emory University Library, I was allowed to the shelves. There, while browsing the uncatalogued acquisitions in the storage area, a volume serendipitously made its appearance uh, with a completely different title and author, but bearing exactly the same cover. So as you know, it's not always possible to access the shelves, um, but virtual shelves provided by library catalogs can come to aid. For example, here is a drawing on tracing paper with date of delivery to the engraver and the title, Eulali. I also found another drawing again with the date of delivery and a note on the upper border, not used for Eulali. And on the verso, a big red cross, I don't know if you see it, occupying the whole Victorian surface as if it had been rejected. 
Neither of the two drawings give any detail about the publisher or the author, and unfortunately no diaries or accounts have survived for the year 1869. If one enters titles and date in library catalogues, nothing useful comes out. But in the John Johnson collection of printed ephemera at the Bodleian Libraries, there is a color proof of the cover for uh, A. Woods, Eulali, London, George, Wood, Locke, and Tyler. So now we have a more, more detail in our quest for the printed book. Complete title, author's name, publisher's name, and imprint. And it is now possible to trace copies in public libraries. The other drawing, also conceived for Eulali, but bearing the note not used for Eulali, was used as the cover for John Lang, the forger's wife, from Wardlock and Tyler, 1870. Here, without any clue to help and without the chance to access the shelf, the printed results have been traced by scrutinizing the production of individual publishers, by indexing and checking complete series and the works of individual authors, carefully identifying the period of collaboration between the same artists, engravers, printers, and publishers, and keeping track of copyright and stock sales, changes in publishers' imprints and address, and so on. So we all agree that it, this is a very laborious, time-consuming activity, but once shrewdly defined and refined the areas of investigation, the added value is undeniable. There is, in fact, a high degree of probability that the same illustrator was commissioned more than one illustration for each individual series as a method to increase readers' loyalty. Here, this happened, for example, for uh, the Six Penny Volume Library, where three covers were designed by the same illustrator in a period of a year and a half. Once the titles composing a series have been isolated, connoisseurship and the ability in the analysis of illustrator styles and engravers' techniques play a major role. Now, stylistic analysis is of great help in detecting whether an illustration was intended for a black and white result and was not, on the contrary, printed in color, and a variation, a variation in, news, in news that is usually reported by meticulous cross-hatching and exaggerated contrasts. So when I stumbled upon this yellow back, I immediately recognized Crane's style, then pinpointed the signature of Crane's in the lower left corner and Evans's in the lower right one. But I also realized that the original drawing and block were not intended for a color result. Then history of publishing came to my help because in the mid 19th century, a novel was nearly always first published in three volumes, the famous Tripodeca, then issued in one volume, bound in cloth, sometimes illustrated with a black and white frontispiece, and finally issued as a yellow bag, that means paper over boards cover, with the text usually stereotyped from uh, the one volume edition, and the cover usually borrowed from the illustra illustrated frontispiece, but printed in color. This made things easy, and I looked for the one volume cloth bound edition for Charlie Tonian, which was used uh, a year or two years before. Other evidences about books and their illustrations are provided by printing matrices, mainly wood blocks, but also process blocks, casts, stereotyped and electrotyped plates. The large majority of these items have been destroyed or melted. Those few which survive today have escaped cataloging standards and are now, most of the times, unrecorded and buried in library storages. In these cases, real archaeological excavations are demanded, though prom promising treasure troves of Im immense riches. Now, a week ago, I visited the St. Bride Foundation Library here in London to analyze some blocks for Randolph Caldecott's picture books. Nothing really precious, since these blocks were produced for later reprints of Caldecott's classics, in this case, the Queen of Arts. But hidden beneath beneath the, the packing uh, on the back of the redwood block, uh, there came the trove, a fragment of an original block used to print in color a yellowback cover. Another fragment is to be found on the back of another block stored in another box. Side by side, these two fragments fr formed a large part of the original cover's key block, uh, Paul's tail, we read, George Rutledge and Sons Limited. 
I have to stress here that no other such block appears to have survived apart from these at the St. Bride's and a few, very few, at typography and graphic communication department, University of Reading. It would now be possible to proceed and trace the printed results. Unfortunately, this is not an easy task. We only have the cover title and a range of dates deduced from the publisher's imprint, because we know that Routledge became a limited company in 1891. At the moment, I've been able to find only one ancestor, so to say, of this cover, used for an edition of Poe's Tales of Mystery and Imagination, published by Routledge in 1882, while our St. Bride's blocks date according to the imprint after 1891. The image on the front cover is exactly the same, but, well, this is mirrored, of, of course, um, mm, but the layout, the title, and the publisher's imprint differ. It appears evident that the pristine block engraved for the 1882 edition had been trimmed in 1891 or afterwards to include a new title and publisher's imprint, but no copies for these issues issue have been traced so far. So even if unsuccessful, this quest shows, I believe, the additional insights offered by materials of this kind into otherwise unknown aspects of book production. So to conclude, thanks to Lara uh, and for this com and for thanks to, to this conference, I, I realized for the first time how I ended up building my own and made tools, as we all do, <laughs> in trying to answer the specific questions posed by my object of research working as an archaeologist in search of, for the evidences of the transit of the illustrated books from the printed presses through the market to the shelves, I developed a methodology that combines an object-based interdisciplinary approach with auxiliary evidences available from external sources. So at the very end, disciplinary boundaries, art history, book history, history of publishing, cataloging, library sciences, they all crumble and sector melt together in front of the very same object, the book. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much, Francesca. You made it look very easy. <laughs> um, it, it's a very, very impressive range of libraries and types of work that you've had to do there. Um, we've probably just got time for one or two questions, uh, if somebody has, has a question. Any questions? Um, well, I think in the interest of time, perhaps we should press on, but I, I expect people will think okay. of things they want to talk <laughs> to you after, after coffee or during tea. So um, thank you again very much.